I invite all of us to stand in body or in spirit for our call to worship and invocation. It is the season of light. Come and bathe in its beauty. It is the season of revelation. Come and be inspired and transformed. It is the season of inclusion. Come and know that you are welcome just as you are. We are taking no shortcuts. Come and walk in the footsteps of Jesus from the Jordan River to the Sea of Galilee to the mountain where Jesus taught. Come and make your own journey. Be washed, be called, and be fed. And let us pray. God of incarnation, the song of the angels is stilled, the star in the sky is gone. The kings and the princes are home, the shepherds are back with their flocks. The Christ child has journeyed with his parents to Egypt to flee the wrath of Herod, has come to Nazareth and grown into a teenager, running circles around the synagogue leaders has knelt, has felt his calling to follow where you would lead to serve the poor and outcast and seek new ways to live. And he stands now at the edge of the Jordan with John. We come to be disciples in the midst of the world's trials and tribulations, in the midst of our own sorrow and sin, and in the cradle of human need to which Jesus showed the way. We too stand at the edge of the Jordan. Come, holy dove, alight on us and set us free. Amen. And our children are invited to meet with Alana at the back to carry forward the light as we sing together our opening hymn. We call ourselves disciples. perhaps the, not the first to greet you Happy New Year, but Happy New Year, everyone. Um, as we look forward to the new year, certainly this church will have a number of new opportunities for interesting things we can do here within these walls and new opportunities for outreach, things we can do in the community. Though it is not 
out with the old, in with the new. We still have the old, still have the old parking lot that needs to be plowed, the old furnace that needs to keep itself going. So for all things old and new, I believe our children and musicians shall collect this morning's offering. Gracious God, we call ourselves disciples to live in word and deed. Please guests, please bless these gifts, O God, to serve and to help those in need. Amen. Let us sing together our hymn of prayer, Water, River, Spirit, Grace. God, it is in many ways the hardest time of year. It is cold and dark, and the joy and busyness of Advent and Christmas are behind us. We are hunkered down for the long stretch of winter before us. We pray for all for whom these months are hardest, for those living houseless on the streets, for those who can't afford to pay for heat, for those who are lonely and those who are alone. May our ministries of compassion be evergreen. May we bring light to those in need. May we be like healing waters to thaw the bleakness of this season. We pray, O oh God, for our families who are grieving, for our members who are facing terminal illness, for those who are struggling with eyesight or memory loss, 
for all who are caretakers, for those in chronic pain, for those with family members in crisis, for those who are themselves in crisis, for those receiving treatments or recovery from surgery, for those traveling. We pray, O oh God, for our teenagers with all their challenges, for parents, for children. God of love, shower down blessings on each of these. And O oh God, recarve the depths your fingers traced in each of us. May we be filled with your spirit and your grace. Now we raise a prayer in unison as Jesus invited his disciples to do. Holy One, may the realm of your love dawn upon the earth and in our hearts, a realm with bread, forgiveness, and justice for all. Lead us not to the shortcuts that tempt us, but to the long journey of grace. Amen. Dennis and I have traveled extensively to every state in the Union and many, many countries around the world. So there are many stories I could tell you about taking a journey and shortcuts that sometimes led to adventure and sometimes didn't turn out so well. But when I was asked to share a journey from my life, my first thought was not any of those stories, but a quote from Wallace Stevens that Carissa mentioned last week in her sermon, a poet is the priest of the invisible. As she reminded us last Sunday, poetry and ritual are crucial to our journeys. <clears throat> and one way I do express my spiritual journey is writing poetry. And writing is always a reminder that there are rarely shortcuts. Rewrite after rewrite after rewrite to say what I was being led to say. A big shout out to Carol Griever and Pam McKinney who've been on this journey with me. Today, <clears throat> I'm gonna to read three poems. And I have asked uh, to have those poems displayed as I read them. So slide one, please. One of my favorite poems that I've written is The Prodigal Son, because it tries to answer the question, where is the mother in this parable? A prodigal son, the good dad, and the grieving mom. A meditation on Luke 15, 11 to 32. Here we go again. Of course he comes home. <coughs> Excuse me. Here we go again. Of course he comes home when needs demand. No money, no hope, no thought of change. Another broken heart, another scarred soul. So here we go again. Dad rushes out to greet our son, the alcoholic broken one. I'm here to let, I'm left to comfort our stay at home one. A stand up guy, steadfast every day. No fatted calf for him, for his labors, his thoughtfulness, his caring. Here we go again. I want to rush to our wayward son as well though boundaries must be set. I must not forget the hours, days, lost to grief. Where is he, alive or dead? Wounds too deep, too prone. Wounds too deep, too painful to probe. We are all wounded and are wounding. Amends are hollow. Two cherished children, two bereaved parents. 
hoping beyond hope this time will be different. Slide two, please. I wrote this poem, <coughs> excuse me, last year. Nope, sorry, stay with slide two, please. Thank you. This poem is called um, Meditation on Van Gogh's Pieta. So this, this is his painting on the screen. And he wrote it, he wrote, <laughs> I wrote my poem last Advent. He painted this picture while he was in a Saint Asylum. And it came to me that um, in the voice of Mary, what was she experiencing at his death? So this poem is called Meditation on Van Gogh's The Pieta. Help me. No, please stay with the picture. I'm sorry. That poem will come next. I'm sorry I didn't make that clear. So we're staying on the picture for this one. Meditation on Van Gogh's The Pieta. Help me. My beautiful boy is dead. Astonish the priests. I'm sorry. So be my beautiful boy is dead. So smart, so willing to help. Astounded the priest, loved the common folks, healed the broken, broke the imposters. Everyone he knew took a piece of him. The crowds wanted food, help, his companions to sit beside him. I only wanted to hold him. Only now will he let me. Many thought he would save them from hunger, mental illness, the Romans, they must save themselves as his ministry came to this. All my tears wept, all my sorrow lived. I, didn't, I did not want a savior, only a son. Now slide three, please. <clears throat> my last poem is also a meditation on a scripture passage. Ephesians 2, 10. When I first heard this, a uh, uh, passage. I don't remember ever having heard it before, or maybe this was a special translation. But as the British would say, I was gobsmacked, gobsmacked, and astonished. So now this poem, God's poem. Am I a number? Am I a disease? Am I a longing? Am I a thought? No, none of these. I am a multiverse. A piece of sushi. I am a multiverse, a mixed metaphor, a living, walking thoroughfare. Oh, so religious, oh, so sexual, oh, so secular. A delicious wine, a piece of sushi, rotten egg, even a rotten egg like Balut. As mom would say, she's a doozy. Here's what I am God's poem hurled into a hurting world. So now back to me, please. I promise you I did uh, practice this a lot, but I was having some problems this morning reading. I apologize, but I'm gonna end now with a haiku I just wrote today. Life is a journey, bring your all to the table. Shortcuts discouraged. Thank you. Uh, beautiful to have you share your poetry with us this morning and let us make our response by singing together bless now O god the journey
And now a reading from the epistles, Acts 10, 34 to 43. And I'm reading from the translation called The Message. Peter fairly exploded with his good news. It's God's own truth. Nothing could be plainer. God plays no favorites. It makes no difference who you are or where you're from. If you want God and are ready to live God's ways, the door is open. The message God sent to the children of Israel that through Jesus Christ, everything is being put together again. Well, God's doing it everywhere among everyone. You know the story of what happened in Judea. It began in Galilee after John preached a total life change. Then Jesus arrived from Nazareth, anointed by God with the Holy Spirit, ready for action. He went through the country helping people and healing everyone who was beaten down by the devil. He was able to do all this because God was with him. And we saw it, saw it all, everything he did in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem where the powerful king, where the powerful killed him, hung him from a cross. But in these days, God has had him up, alive and out where he could be seen. Not everyone saw him. He wasn't put on public display. Witnesses had been carefully handpicked by God beforehand. Us, we are the ones there to eat and drink with him after he came back from the dead. He commissioned us to announce this in public to bear solemn witness that he is in fact the one who God destined as judge of the living and dead. But we're not alone in this. Our witness is that he is the means to forgiveness of sins and it's backed up by the witness of all the prophets. I'll follow that with a reading from the gospels. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. So take no shortcuts, you know, when you take no shortcuts, you can see life in the woods, in the forests. You have a chance to lie back on your back and look at the stars, contemplate life. You can walk through the snow and get lost. Um, that's what this song is about. Have you ever wandered lonely through the woods? Everything there feels just as it should. You're part of life there, you're part of something good. If you've ever wandered lonely through the world. you 
This season, our first reading each Sunday will actually be from the epistles of Paul, specifically the first three chapters of his first letter to the church at Corinth. But today, our first reading is not an epistle at all. It is instead from a pivotal story in the book of Acts. Acts tells the tale of the early church. From the ascension of Jesus up into heaven, to the choosing of Matthias, a witness to the resurrection, to replace Judas as one of the twelve, to the coming of the Holy Spirit as flame and wind on Pentecost, to the early formation of churches and of worship, to the ministry of Peter, to the call of Paul, the Pharisee, to become a follower of Jesus, to the telling of all of Paul's journeys and the tension between Peter and Paul, ending with the all-important Council of Jerusalem and the inclusion of Gentiles into the church, followed by Paul's imprisonment and his journey to Rome. And in terms of discipleship, Acts tells how the 12 disciples, which means a follower, became the 12 apostles, which means a person sent. No longer followers, but now leaders and teachers sent by Jesus to share good news. The Acts of the Apostles details their transformation and the establishment of the church by their leadership. Now, just after the story of Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus, we are told a story about Cornelius and Peter, the end of which we heard today. It's a story in which each of them has a dream that then brings them together in a way that might not otherwise have been possible since Peter was a faithful Jew and Cornelius was a Gentile. Cornelius dreams that he is to go and seek out Peter, and Peter dreams about unclean food and hears the voice of God saying, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. When Cornelius finds Peter, Peter's heart has been opened by this dream to understand that there is nothing profane about Cornelius. And it is at this point that Peter says, exploding with his good news, God plays no favorites. Or as the NRSV version says, God shows no partiality. Or in the King James Version, God is no respecter of persons. 
Or as the good news says, I now realize that it is true that God treats everyone on the same basis. And while it is true that Cornelius is converted by his encounter with Peter, it is equally true that Peter is converted by his encounter with Cornelius. Peter wasn't ever objecting to the idea of sharing the gospel with the Gentiles, but he was tied to the traditions that insisted they first become pure, become Jewish through circumcision, through the Levitical codes about food and clothing and sexuality, before they could become part of the new covenant. His dream and his encounter with Cornelius that follows disabuse him of that idea. And as Eugene Peterson paraphrases it, he fairly exploded with the good news. God plays no favorites. It makes no difference who you are or where you're from. If you want God and are ready to live God's ways, the door is open. The door is open. If you want God, the door is open. But Peter does add this little phrase. If you want God and are ready to live God's ways, the door is open. Little caveat there. Ready to live God's ways. Or from the NRSV, do what is right and acceptable to God. Later in the passage, Peter refers to five actions of Jesus that seem to put some arms and legs on what it means to live God's ways, what it means to do what is right. First, John preached a total life change, and Jesus asked John to baptize him. In other words, Jesus committed himself to a total life change. Second, Jesus went through the country helping people. Third, he healed those oppressed by the devil. And fourth, he preached forgiveness. Fifth, in his resurrection appearance, he ate and drank with others as he had done throughout his ministry. These five things. This is what Peter attests to. This is doing what is right and acceptable to God. This is living God's ways. We know from the prophets, a whole 700 years earlier, that God's ways are not sacrifice, or laws and rules of dress and food, or rituals or worship. Hosea hears God saying, I desire mercy, not sacrifice and knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Amos hears God saying, I hate, I despise your festivals, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps, but lest justice roll down like waters and righteousness, like an ever-flowing stream. And Micah hears God saying, God has told you what is good. And what does God require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Even though Peter has been a faithful Jew his whole life, has read the prophets, Even though he left everything to follow Jesus and followed right to the courtyard where Jesus was being tried, right to the cross, right to the empty tomb, right to the ascension, and preached on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came, even then, 
Peter clung to a deeply ingrained idea that God's highest priority is that we remain pure by doing all the right rituals. This is Peter's great awakening. This is why he fairly explodes with the good news. Finally, nothing could be plainer. The door is open. The door is open whether you go to worship or you don't go. The door is open whether you've been baptized or you haven't been baptized. The door is open whether you say your prayers or you don't say your prayers. The door is open whether you fit into the mold or you bust right out of that mold. The door is open whether you've heard the good news or you've never heard the good news. The door is open whether you're from the Bible Belt or from Boulder, Colorado. The door is open whether you're conservative or you're progressive, gay or straight, trans or cis, tall or short, blue eyes, green eyes, brown eyes, a 10th generation American or a first generation American or a native American or a descendant of slaves. The door is open whether you are rich or you are poor. The door is open if you believe everything in the Bible is the literal truth or if you approach it as literature, metaphor, and story. The door is open if you hold fast to every doctrine of the church or if you follow your heart and are full of questions. The door is open. Everything else is a gift from God to make our lives better and to help us make the lives of others better. They aren't rules that if we break, the door slams shut on us. What kind of God would that be to worship? No, everything else is a gift. And if we see them as anything but gifts, they are a millstone around our necks, a heavy yoke to bear. If we want God, if that is our heart's desire, if we want to live to our full potential as creatures of God, if that is of any interest to you, then God not only leaves the door open, but God offers us through prophets and poets and priests and wisdom teachers, including Jesus, a path to that door. There isn't a shortcut, but there is a path. Like our path through the forest of trees here on the chancel, a path, and with every gift God gives, that we unwrap, like a child unwrapping a present on Christmas morning, sometimes slowly and carefully and full of wonder, and sometimes in a mad, desperate, gleeful dash. Every time, we take one more step along the way. On this first Sunday after Epiphany, this ordinal, ordinary Sunday, if you remember that sermon. We remember the three magi who took a long path following a star and entered in through a doorway giving gifts to the Christ child of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gifts Jesus could not unwrap or play with. Gifts that he would not understand until he was grown. Gifts that heralded a long path, a, a journey of his own towards a calling and a destiny, leading to the temptations, the temple, the trial, and the tree. On this first Sunday after Epiphany, we also recall the story of Jesus' baptism, the journey to John at the Jordan, to the gift of fresh, clean, crisp, water. 
the gift of feeling born anew. The gift of being held in his cousin's arms and in the open wings of the Spirit as a beloved child of God. Water that in turn led him on a path to wine and bread and a welcome table among those lost at the wayside of the world. The gift God offers us is a total life change. Not rules to appease God's whims, but gifts to give us back our humanity. Humanity we may have lost along the way. Gifts to lead us to relationship with ourselves and our neighbors and with God. Gifts to find grace and welcome. Gifts to feel true forgiveness. Gifts to help us forgive others and release the hate, the fear, the envy, the pride, the trauma that prevents us from forgiving others. Gifts to live right at the wayside with others who are lost. Gifts to sit together at a welcome table. Gifts to stop playing favorites Gifts to stop showing partiality. Gifts to stand up to the oppressors, the ones that live in our own psyches and the ones that rule the world. Gifts to worship and to pray, to be baptized in water, to see, receive the bread and wine. Gifts to sing and to dance. Gifts to play melody with the guitar and the banjo and the drum. Gifts to tell our stories and all the stories and poetry in between. Gifts to gather together and share as joys and concerns. This is doing what is right and acceptable to God. This is living God's ways. It is receiving God's gifts with glee and with wonder. We all get so excited about the new year. Setting new goals for ourselves to live by. Resolutions that are statistically dropped by mid-February. Which doesn't mean those resolutions aren't worth making. Every new start when life is out of control is worthwhile. But God has already given us the gift of a new start the weekly gift of Sabbath, the day of resurrection, the day to turn around, this day of resolutions, this day of fresh starts, this day of forgiveness, this day of hope and joy. Today, as you begin this new year, receive the gift of this day, of water, wine, bread, song, Spirit, this day exploding with good news. Unwrap it like a child with glee and wonder and set off once more along that path to becoming more human and towards the door where God is always, always waiting. And then you know what? We don't have to wait another year. We get to do it all again next Sunday. Amen. And let us sing together our hymn of response.
come now to this holy table to receive these gifts on this holy day. Gifts that Jesus gave to those disciples who gathered with him on that last night during that meal where they celebrated a story of freedom. He took some of the common bread from their table, he blessed it and he broke it, and he said, take and eat. This is my body, it is given for you. And in the same way, after that supper, he took one of the cups and he said, this is a new covenant of love. Do this in remembrance of me. And so we stand at this table each week to remember all of God's covenantal promises, to join our longings for freedom and for justice with those throughout the ages. And let us give thanks. God, we remember for this morning. It is. Thank you. God, we remember and give thanks for your son. And we ask that you bless and pour your spirit upon these simple things. Together. Make this broken bread whole in our taking. Make this full cup overflow in our sharing. These elements nourish and sustain us. Our way, our truth, our life. Our creator, our redeemer, our sustainer. Praise be to you now, today, tomorrow, and forever. Preparation as we prepare our hearts to receive this meal and to receive our children back into worship. Now we'll first serve those of you who are on our Zoom the bread of life and the cup of love. And for all of us here, please come forward as we share this meal together. Let us keep this feast.
friends, hear the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, God's grace is revealed to heal our brokenness, to forgive our sins, to set us free from all that would oppress us. And let God's people say, Amen. If there are any who would like to become part of our community of faith as we sing our next song, I invite you to come forward. Our song is, We Are Walking in the Light of God, and Let Us Stand. blessed by God and blessed by this community of faith. Let us go to be a blessing in God's world. And now may the peace of God be with each of you. Amen. And let us greet one another with a sign of peace.